news with a holiday mystery in the Central Valley. Our top story of the day is a breaking development in the search for Lacey Peterson, the pregnant California woman who vanished on Christmas Eve. Lacey went missing Christmas Eve. She's 27 years old and she is over eight months pregnant. Hello, and welcome to the channel. This is part 7 of our series on Lacey Peterson. If you're new here, thanks for joining us. And if you're a returning visitor, welcome back. At the end of our last episode, Sharon Rocha received a phone call from her son-in-law Scott, that would cause her to live out the rest of her days, with a broken heart. It's the phone call every mother dreads, it's really unthinkable, and one that changed Sharon Rocha's life forever. On December 24, 2002, her son-in-law Scott Peterson called to say that her daughter Lacey, nearly eight months pregnant, was missing. On December 24th, 2002, shortly after 5.15 p.m., I received a phone call and heard the devastating words that forever changed my life. Lacey's missing. I knew in my heart that something terrible had happened to my daughter and my grandson. My world collapsed around me. Sharon was stricken with panic almost instantly. The brief moments she'd spent scrambling to get dressed, after hanging the phone on the receiver in the bedroom, and walking down the hall to Ron, in the living room, had been enough to send a wave of terror over her. And by the time she was able to tell Ron who had just called, all she could hear replaying in her mind were Scott's words, Lacey's missing. He didn't say he didn't know where she was, or that he couldn't find her, he said that she was missing. Her mind and her heart were racing with adrenaline thinking about what that could mean for her daughter and her grandson. How could she possibly be missing? As Sharon felt herself beginning to fall apart, Ron held her steady, and did what he could, to calm her. He told her gently, she's not missing. She's gotta be somewhere, she's out shopping or running around with a friend. She's not missing, it's okay, he tried to reassure her. But Sharon replayed the brief conversation with Scott over again in her head, as he held her. Hi, Mom? Is Lacey there? It took her a moment to make sense of the question. Why would she be there? Lacey and Scott were expected at Ron and Sharon's house for dinner at 6 o'clock, in fact, Sharon was in her bedroom getting dressed when Scott called her at around 5.15. But when he said he was calling from home, and thought Lacey might be at her place, Sharon was confused. She told him no. That Lacey wasn't there, and growing more concerned, asked what he meant. It's what Scott told her next, that left her absolutely shaken. Hmm. When I got home, Lacey's car was in the driveway. Mackenzie was in the backyard with his leash on but, Lacey's missing. Lacey's missing. Lacey's missing. As Sharon considered his words, her hands began to shake, when the phone rang again. It was Scott, and he sounded more worried now. After calling Lacey's closest friends, at Sharon's instruction during their first conversation, none of them heard from Lacey that day either. This time, Sharon told him to check with the neighbors, and call her right back. Praying that with her car still in the driveway, maybe Lacey left on foot, to deliver cookies, or have a visit with someone in the neighborhood. But it seems that by this point, Scott had already been over to check with Amy Krigbaum, who lived across the street. Their other neighbors directly across Covina Avenue, the Medinas, weren't home that afternoon. But Amy, and her partner Tara, were both home that day. While they hadn't seen Lacey, they did notice a couple of things about the Peterson house. Amy told Scott she assumed they might have been on one of their frequent trips out of town, when she noticed all the shades in the front of the house, had remained closed all day. She also told him that she'd noticed the Petersons' Christmas lights turn on at around 4.30. Lacey must have been home to light them up. But Scott was distraught, and her mention of the Christmas lights did nothing to calm him, though Amy didn't know at the time that the lights were on timers, and not helpful in pinning down the time Lacey was last known to be safe at home. At this point, Amy began to get worked up as well. Eventually, she said her adrenaline caused things to become, quote, mumble-jumbled, end quote. But Amy did recall Scott telling her, that he'd been trying to reach Lacey by phone all day, with no success. And at some point, he also told her, he'd been at the golf course that day. After they spoke, she said she watched Scott jump over the planter in the lawn, 
and head toward the path that led down to the park. The next time Amy looked out her front door, Scott had Mackenzie with him, and was headed towards Karen Service's house. Karen was Scott and Lacey's only next-door neighbor, as the house on the other side of them was vacant at the time. She would end up being an important witness later, and while she wasn't home that evening, her whereabouts that day would become nearly as important as Scott's. After speaking with Amy, Scott went back in the house, called Sharon back, and got Mackenzie to go back out searching with him. Sharon suggested he check with the neighbors on the second call, so Scott headed next door to Karen's, but she wasn't home that afternoon either. Having no luck with any of the immediate neighbors, Scott called Sharon back a third time. There's been some questions surrounding the length of time Scott spent trying to reach Lacey's friends and looking for her at their neighbors' homes, so let's break down the timeline. Scott's first call to Sharon was at 5.17 that evening, and they spoke for just a few short minutes. She told him to call Lacey's girlfriends, to see if any of them had spoken with her, and call her right back. At 5.26, Scott called Lacey's best friend, Stacy. He asked her to make some calls to other friends, and abruptly got off of the phone, and headed to the first neighbor's house that appeared to have someone home, Amy Krigbaum's. It was roughly 5.30 when he knocked on her door. While Scott spoke with his neighbor Amy, Stacy called friends Lori and Kim, but neither of them had any contact with Lacey that day, which she quickly reported back to Scott. While on the phone with Stacy the second time, Scott asked her if anyone they knew drove a white truck. Stacy said yes, that Lori did, but told him she'd already spoken to Lori, and she hadn't been there that day. Just after this call, at 5.30 p.m., Lacey's cell phone received a strange call, but it wasn't from Scott. A message in a gruff voice was left on her voicemail saying, Lacey, everybody's looking for you. It's initially assumed that this call either came from Ron or possibly her father, Dennis, though there was never any mention of either of them calling her phone during this initial search period. Scott left Amy's, took the second call from Stacy, and by 5.32, he was back on the phone with Sharon. She told him to check with the neighbors, which he did, with Mackenzie, before calling her back again just a few minutes later. It's after this call, that Sharon has Ron call the local hospitals, and then, the police. Yeah. 
As Ron was on the phone with police dispatch at 5.48, Scott began calling other family and friends. The first call he made was at 5.44, to an unidentified number. Hopefully more details about who this number belonged to, the mysterious gruffy voiced message left for Lacey at 5.30, and the white truck Scott mentioned earlier, will be found in the trial record, so we can share them, but for now, these details remain unclear. After his call to the unidentified number at 5.44, Scott called Lacey's sister, Amy. One minute later, he called Sharon back again. After this, he called another friend, Greg Reed, whose mother owned the house on the other side of Scott and Lacey. Greg's mother passed in the spring, but he was the caretaker for his mother's empty home. Greg also knew Scott from the Rotary Club, the Del Rio Country Club, and recently, the Petersons had been attending the Lamaze classes Greg and his wife Kristen, who was also pregnant began running out of their home. While Scott was unable to reach Greg, he left a frantic message on his answering machine, looking for Lacey. His next call was to his close friend, Guy Milagy. He reached out to another friend, Brian Ulrich, who was not only engaged to one of Lacey's closest girlfriends, but was also Scott and Lacey's financial advisor and insurance broker, which will come up later. After his neighbor Karen still wasn't home around 8.40 that night, Scott called her as well, to see if she'd seen or heard from his wife that day. She hadn't had any contact with Lacey, but Karen did have a strange encounter with their dog, Mackenzie. When Scott heard that she had found Mackenzie in the street that morning with his leash still on, he immediately handed the phone off to law enforcement to get the details. Scott received several incoming calls during this short time as well, and at 6 o'clock, he called Sharon again. By this time, Sharon had her friend Sandy drive her to the park and she told Scott to meet them there. Sharon was so distraught, she'd nearly fell into Sandy's arms when she picked her up from the house. With Ron being told to wait at home for a responding officer to arrive, Sharon knew she would be too upset to drive herself, and there was no way she was going to wait a moment longer to start searching for Lacey. When she and Sandy pulled into the parking area at the park, Scott said he was already there. They made a plan to meet by the tennis courts. Sandy had barely stopped the car before Sharon jumped out, running into the park, calling, then yelling, and eventually screaming Lacey's name. While she began her search along the path she knew Lacey normally stuck to, she soon turned her attention to the darker corners, behind buildings, and in the undergrowth on the outskirts of the green spaces. But as she made her way farther and farther into the park, Sharon said she quickly became aware that she was alone. She said that other than Sandy and herself, the park was completely empty. 
By the time she reached the tennis courts, near the far end of the park, she had become absolutely frantic and increasingly desperate. Sharon began searching the trash bins. Never considering the horrific discovery she could have made, if someone had decided to hurt Lacey in the park that day, and she had been the one to end up finding her. This unthinkable possibility she's forced to contemplate, would be just the beginning of Sharon's nightmare. She looked everywhere that wasn't wide open, but finding no sign of her in the tennis court area, where Lacey would generally loop around and head back home, and seeing that Scott hadn't found his way there to meet up with her either, she turned to go back to the car. There, she saw that Scott's neighbor, Amy Krigbaum, had shown up, and already recruited her father to help in the search, and Sharon began to wonder again about where her son-in-law could be. She said she'd been there long enough, that she and Scott should have run into one another by now, even if they'd started on opposite ends of the park. Just as this crossed her mind, Sharon saw a jogger heading up a nearby hill. She chased him down, yelling and calling for him to stop. He was startled, and a little wary of her at first, she was admittedly a bit unhinged, though understandably so. Sharon told him about Lacey, and quickly gave him a brief description. The jogger said he hadn't seen Lacey on his run, but told her he was a cardiologist and offered to quickly check and take records for hospitals across the county for Lacey's name. Of course, Sharon gratefully accepted his help, but the call he made for her didn't yield any results. She thanked the doctor again, and noticed he was only wearing running shorts, and was bare-chested. This touches on what the weather was like in Modesto that day. Many would later say that it was so cold, Lacey wouldn't have gone out for a walk at all. The low for that Christmas Eve was just 34 degrees Fahrenheit, and with a high of just 51 during the warmest part of the day, it wasn't exactly California dreaming in Modesto that Tuesday morning. What do you guys think? Is 40 or 45 degrees too cold to exercise in, or do you think it's just the right temperature to get the heart pumping, like our friendly neighborhood bare-chested cardiologist? Leave your thoughts in the comments. Making her way back to the parking area again, Sharon saw that her nephew Zach, and his mother Carol, who was Ron's sister, were just pulling into the lot. Ron had begun calling family and friends for help from home, not long after Sharon left for the park. And then, she finally spotted Scott. He was walking along the creek that borders the back of the park. She saw that he had Mackenzie on his leash, but he was facing away from her, towards the water. She began to call for him, but got no response. Sharon got closer and closer, calling his name, louder and louder, but he continued to stare off into the water, seeming not to hear. Until her nephew Zach ran up to him, finally getting his attention. Sharon made her way to the creek where he still stood, hoping he would give her more information, or at least offer her some reassurance or comfort, as she became unraveled and filled with terror for her missing pregnant daughter. But Scott offered none of those things. Instead, they had the following exchange. He was still looking away from her, when Sharon asked, Do you have any idea where Lacey is? No, he softly replied. Then she asked him, Was her purse at the house? Scott said he didn't know, so she asked, Is the house unlocked? Yes, he said. Then Sharon told him, I'm going to the house to see if I can find her purse, where does she keep it? He said, On the hook by the front door. But as Sharon spoke with him, Scott seemed to be in a daze. He stared vacantly into the trees across the water, never looking at her once. She was so beside herself, she didn't consider how odd his reaction was, at the time. Later, she would recall this as the first major display, of his abnormal behavior. It wouldn't be long before Scott's bizarre demeanor, would be on display for the entire world to see. I, I was staggered by it. I had no idea was coming. The first show would begin straight away, with law enforcement. To the trained eye of police and detectives, the suspicion surrounding Scott Peterson grew instantly, though Sharon and her family would take a lot more convincing. The first officer on the scene encountered Sharon at the park, as she was leaving to search the house for Lacey's purse. He instructed Sharon to head back to the house, but not to go inside until police could do a walkthrough. This was Modesto PD officer John Evers, the log in his squad car stamped his arrival time at 6.11 p.m. When he encountered Sharon, she was hysterical, and being consoled by a friend. Evers spoke with Sharon briefly, before Scott approached him soon after. But, it might surprise some to learn, that one minute before Officer Evers arrived on the scene, at 6.10 p.m., 
Scott was on the phone with the police himself to report his pregnant wife, missing. Officer Evers was the primary unit on the scene, because he responded to the missing person's call first, but within minutes, he had two additional officers arrive at the park to assist, Officers Spurlock and Letzinger. Around 6.15, just as the three officers were leaving the park to perform their initial walkthrough of the Peterson house, their commanding officer Sergeant Dewerfeld pulled into the parking lot and received a quick briefing on the situation. He put in a call to the Modesto PD Communications Center to run a search of area hospitals for pregnant females fitting Lacey's description. He also put in a call to Lt. Abel, the watch commander, to request a FLIR helicopter to search the area, before following the three responding officers back to the house. Scott headed back to the house on Covina as well, though it took him a few minutes longer to arrive. By the time Sergeant Dewerfeld arrived at the house, his officers had already begun their first walkthrough, clearing each room systematically for signs of an intruder, a break-in, a struggle, a robbery, or foul play. They ensured Lacey nor anyone else, was either hiding or hidden anywhere on the property. After finding everything in relatively normal condition, they brought Scott through the house along with them on another walkthrough, asking him to point out things that were out of place, missing or disturbed, and getting more details from Scott about their morning, including Lacey's plans for the day, and his fishing trip to Berkeley. By the end of it, Officer Spurlock got Evers' attention and whispered in his ear. He told Evers that during some of the questioning, Scott struggled to tell him what type of fish he had been fishing for that morning, or what type of bait he used. Officers also made note of the mops and wet pavement just outside of the back door, and a scrunched-up rug pushed up against the threshold. They also found Lacey's purse, not on the hook by the front door, but in their master bedroom closet, with her wallet and ID, still inside. On the kitchen island, the officers also saw a phone book, open to a full-page ad, for a criminal defense attorney, specializing in murder and domestic violence cases. When Sergeant Dewerfeld, who had been monitoring the house from his squad car in the driveway, received his report from Officer Evers, he gave orders for him to lead a search with Spurlock and Letzinger, through the vacant Reed house next door. Greg Reed received a missed call from Scott at around 5.45, and headed over to the Petersons' place directly after listening to his message about not being able to find Lacey. He arrived around 6 p.m., and by 6.30 or 7 o'clock he unlocked his deceased grandmother's home, and guided officers through the property. They searched the premises extensively, and in the garage as they were leaving, a conversation speculating about what might have happened to Lacey, and where she might be, led to one of the officers saying that they already had a pretty good idea of what happened to her. Greg spoke with an officer again a few hours later, and after their conversation, as he drove home with his pregnant wife, and Lacey's friend, Kristen, Greg told her plainly, they think Scott did it. Apparently, Evers, Spurlock, and Letzinger, weren't alone in their suspicions of Scott. Immediately after telling Evers to take officers on a search of the Reed House, Sergeant Dewerfeld made another call to the command center, this time to request a homicide detective to respond to 523 Covina Avenue. This was at 6.30 p.m., less than an hour after Ron's 911 call and before Sergeant Dewerfeld ever met or spoke with Scott. By the time Dewerfeld's subordinate officers finished the search of the vacant house next door, he'd contacted the homicide detective on rotation that evening, El Brocchini. The sergeant would later clarify that this is far from normal police procedure, and that to have a detective assigned to a missing person's case, especially so early on was unusual, but he felt that it was warranted, and made the call. He then sent Evers, Spurlock, and Letzinger to the park, making them the first law enforcement presence to join the search for Lacey Peterson. It was estimated that nearly a hundred people were either in the park looking for her, or gathered on the street outside of Scott and Lacey's house, many of them trying to console Sharon, who was still extremely upset. After sending his officers to the park, Sergeant Dewerfeld became the only officer on the scene for a period of time. While keeping an eye on Scott, who after walking the neighborhood around 6.30 showing photos of Lacey, was finally told by law enforcement, not to leave the house anymore. The sergeant was also fielding near constant questions, emotional outbursts, and angry criticisms, from Lacey's family and friends. There likely were several heated questions asked about why they were focused on searching the still-locked house next door, before looking in the park. Which was, as far as anyone knew, the most likely place she could be. 
Dewerfeld explained that the anger and frustration is normal from people in similar situations, concerning their loved ones. He also explained that he saw no such reaction or emotional display, from Scott. But, while many others describe his demeanor as calm and flat, Sharon struggled to hold herself together. She relied heavily on an outpouring of love and support from her friends and family to keep her going, and to help her search for her daughter. Sharon's cousin and very close friend Gwen, who had been hosting a dinner party for 30 guests, not only came the instant Sharon called her, she brought all 30 of her guests with her to help look for Lacey. Neighbors had begun to hand out coffee to combat the cold, and at one point Sharon headed home to gather blankets, jackets, and sweaters for as many as she could. She wasn't holding up well and probably needed to feel useful. After asking multiple times to go into the house, wanting to point out anything missing or out of place, she was denied entry each time. When her friend Susan showed up, Sharon was so distraught, she could barely stand on her own, Susie had to help her sit down on the curb, and she did her best to console her friend. Susie probably tried to get Sharon to focus on the encouraging response from authorities and the community, hoping it would mean they would bring Lacey home safely and soon. At 8.30 that night, the FLIR helicopter, which is equipped with infrared body heat detection, requested by Sergeant Dewerfeld arrived, and Sharon's relief at the sight of the helicopter was significant. In her mind, the only sensible conclusion was that Lacey was in that park somewhere. Because Scott told her she had gone there for a walk that day, and nothing else made any sense. She trusted that Lacey was likely in the park, and she knew that the helicopter would probably be able to find her quickly. Sharon watched the chopper make its passes for nearly an hour and a half, she listened intently to the sound of the blades fading away as it flew the three quarters of a mile length of the park, then getting louder as it turned back. She watched and listened, waiting for a reaction from the officer on scene who had radio contact with the pilot, ever hopeful that at any moment they would give the signal that they'd found her. Perhaps with a sprained ankle, or even unconscious somewhere after another dizzy spell, but they'd find her, surely if Lacey were in that park, the helicopter would find her. But, the chopper soon made what would be its final pass, with no sign of Lacey. As Sharon heard it grow farther and farther away, she began to lose her grip all over again. She begged the officer to radio the pilot, pleading with him to call the helicopter back, to keep searching, frustrated thinking that Lacey was in that park somewhere. She was so close, but she may as well have been a thousand miles away, if they couldn't find her. Sharon felt like the helicopter was her last best hope to get her daughter and grandson home safely, out of the bitter cold and darkness. It wouldn't be until the following day that she would begin to wonder if Lacey had ever gone into the park, at all. Sharon didn't sleep that night, and wouldn't rest for countless nights after, for fear of potentially missing a sign or a clue that might lead her to Lacey and Connor. In her heartbreaking and terrifying explanation, she said that instead of sleeping, she listened through the darkness, for Lacey's screams. Not wanting to sleep through her cries for help. While Sharon spent that first night slipping into a nearly maddening level of grief and panic, Ron shared some news with her, that only added to her confusion. Ron's revelation, and more odd behavior from Scott that first night, planted some seeds of doubt in her mind about Scott, though it would be some time before she vocalized her suspicions. While Sharon spent that Christmas Eve with her mind racing until the sun came up, listening for Lacey to cry out to her in the darkness for help, Scott fell under the scrutiny of Detective Al Brocchini, at the police station. Join us next time for Scott's first encounter with Detective Brocchini, and a more detailed look at his timeline for the day. We'll also discuss more observations from friends, neighbors, and Sharon, that would eventually begin to add to their growing doubts about Scott. We'll cover the search efforts made by Lacey's loved ones, that began even before the sun came up on Christmas morning. And we'll talk about Michelle Boer, who already felt so distrustful of Scott by that evening, that she was uncomfortable seeing Lacey's friend group, continue to support him after she went missing. And we'll discover just how accurate Michelle's instincts, would prove to be. Thanks so much for watching, and for showing your support by subscribing to the channel. It's been wonderful to watch the channel grow, and to hear your feedback, theories, questions, and kind words in the comments. If you haven't subscribed, or shared your thoughts with our growing community, please join us, and know that your support and opinions are extremely welcome and valued. Don't forget to click that thumbs up if you liked the episode, and thanks for your patience during the long wait for Part 7's release. 
Part 8 is already in production, and is shaping up to be a longer episode as the drama and scandals unfold. Thanks again for exploring Lacey's story with us, and until next time, stay safe, be kind, and momentum worry.